Hello, everybody. Uh, beginning of the week, I wanted to send out a, a dispatch and say hi. Um, yesterday, we had a concurrence at the uh, um, the flower show in Denver at Gallery 1261. And then I gave a little talk. And um, it was the first concurrence we'd had since since before the pandemic, <laughs> which was great. It was really lovely, and uh, it was great seeing all the folks that came. It was real sweet. Um, so hopefully there'll be more. Nice to do more concurrences, uh, you know, for all kinds of shows and whatever. Anyway, lots going on. Uh, if you're in Boulder later this week, Thursday evening, a reception at Naropa for those interiors. And then Friday, a reception at uh, the St. Julian Fancy Hotel in Boulder, 6 to 8. You're welcome to join, join, join me, join us. Yeah, well, springtime, but it's, you know, Colorado, so it's sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy. Snowed. I think it's going to snow again tomorrow morning. <laughs> anyway, um, I thought what I'd do, I wanted to um, read from John Berger. More John Berger. In the shape of a pocket. Um, and I'm thinking of reading the whole thing. But I, I hope it's not going to be too long for everybody. Uh <laughs> but it's so good. We'll see. Hopefully, it won't be too long, I, and I won't. I won't keep chattering. We'll get. We'll get to it now. We'll go there. Um, okay. This is steps towards a small theory of the visible for Eve. Eve is what's his son. This is son. When I say the first line of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, I imagine this heaven as invisible, unenterable, but intimately close. There's nothing Baroque about it, no swirling infinite space or stunning foreshortening. To find it, if one had the grace, it would only be necessary to lift up something as small as at hand as a pebble or a salt cellar in the, on the table. Perhaps Cellini knew this. Thy kingdom come. The difference is infinite between heaven and earth, yet the distance is minimal. Simone Weil wrote concerning this sentence, Here our desire pierces through time to find eternity behind it <clears throat> and this happens when we know how to turn whatever happens no matter what it is into an object of desire i'm going to say that again i got distracted sorry simon Whale wrote concerning Whale concerning the sentence. Here, our desire pierces through time to find eternity behind it, and this happens when we know how to turn whatever happens, no matter what it is, into an object of desire. Her words might also be a prescription for the art of painting. Today, images abound everywhere. Never has so much been depicted and watched. We have glimpses at any moment of what things look like on the other side of the planet or the other side of the moon. Appearances registered and transmitted with lightning speed. Yet with this, something has innocently changed. They used to be called physical appearances because they belong to solid bodies. Now appearances are volatile. Technological innovation has made it easy 
to separate the apparent from the existent. Technological innovation has made it easy to separate the apparent from the existent. And this is precisely what the present system's mythology continually needs to exploit. It turns appearances into refractions like mirages, refractions not of light, but of appetite. In fact, a single appetite, the appetite for more. Consequently, and oddly, considering the physical implications of the notion of appetite, the existent, the body, disappears. We live within a spectacle of empty clothes and unworn masks. Consider any newsreader on any television channel in any country. These speakers are the mechanical epitome of the disembodied. It took the system many years to invent them and to teach them to talk as they do. No bodies and no necessity. For necessity is the condition of the existent. <clears throat> it is what makes reality real. And the system's mythology requires only the not yet real, the virtual, the next purchase. This produces in the spectator not, as claimed, a sense of freedom, so-called freedom of choice, but a profound isolation. Until recently, history, all the accounts people gave of their lives, all proverbs, fables, parables, confronted the same thing. The everlasting, fearsome, and occasionally beautiful struggle of living with necessity, which is the enigma of existence, that which followed from the creation and which subsequently has always continued to sharpen the human spirit. Necessity produces both tragedy and comedy. It is what you kiss or bang your head against. Today, in the system spectacle, it exists no more. Consequently, no experience is communicated. All that is left to share is the spectacle, the game that nobody plays and everybody can watch. As has never happened before, people have to try to place their own existence and their own pains single-handed in the vast arena of time and the universe. I had a dream in which I was a strange dealer, a dealer in looks or appearances. I collected and distributed them. In my dream, I had just discovered a secret. I discovered it on my own without any help or advice. The secret was to get inside whatever I was looking at. Bucket of water, cow, city like Toledo, seen from above, an oak tree, and once inside to arrange its appearances for the better. Better did not mean making the thing seem more beautiful or more harmonious, nor did it mean making it more typical so that the oak tree might represent all oak trees. It simply meant making it more itself so that the cow or the city or the bucket of water became more evidently unique. The doing of this gave me pleasure and I had the impression that the small changes I made from the inside gave pleasure to others. The secret of how to get inside the object so as to rearrange how it looked was as simple as opening the door of a wardrobe. Perhaps it was merely a question of being there when the door swung open on its own. Yet when I woke up, I couldn't remember how it was done and I no longer knew how to get inside. The history of painting is often represented <clears throat> as a history of succeeding styles. In our time, art dealers and promoters have used this battle of styles to make brand names for the market. Many collectors and museums 
by names rather than works. Maybe it's time to ask a naive question. What does all painting from the Paleolithic period until our century have in common? Every painted image announces, I have seen this. Or when the making of the image was incorporated into a tribal ritual, we have seen this. The this refers to the site represented. Non-figurative art is no exception. A late canvas by Rothko represents an illumination or a colored glow which derived from the painter's experience of the visible. When he was working, he judged his canvas according to something else that he saw. Painting is first an affirmation of the visible which surrounds us and which continually appears and disappears. Without the disappearing, there would perhaps be no impulse to paint, for then the visible itself would possess the surety, the permanence, which painting strives to find. More directly than any other art, painting is an affirmation of the existent, of the physical world into which mankind has been thrown. Animals were the first subject in painting, and right from the beginning, and then continuing through Sumerian, Assyrian, Egyptian, and early Greek art, the depiction of these animals was extraordinarily true. Many millennia had to pass before an equivalent lifelikeness was achieved in the depiction of the human body. At the beginning, the existent was what confronted man. The first painters were hunters whose lives, like everybody else's in the tribe, depended upon their close knowledge of animals. Yet the act of painting was not the same as the act of hunting. The relation between the two is magical. In the number of early cave paintings, there are stencil representations of the human hand beside the animals. We do not know what precise ritual this served. We do know that painting was used to confirm a magical companionship between prey and hunter, or to put it more abstractly between the existent and human ingenuity. Painting was the means of making this companionship explicit and therefore, hopefully, permanent. This may still be worth thinking about long after painting has lost its herds of animals and its ritual function. I still believe it tells us something about the nature of the act. I don't want to go too long for everybody. Um, it's so good. I think I'm about, you know, I'm not even halfway. Oh, all right, I'm going to pause. <laughs> I don't want this part. I don't want the dispatch to be too long. So I'll, I'll come back to this. That Okay. And I'll, and I'm going to, um, I'll put a, I think I have this as a PDF. I'll put a link in the email. Uh, and I'll continue next time. We're about to get to Mount St. Victoire with Cezanne. <laughs> it's really good. Anyway, and then I'll tell you, maybe next time, I'll tell you the story of how I came upon this essay. No, I mean, it It blew me away. It really did. Okay. I'll let it go. Um, yeah. So, have a good week. I'll continue next week. Um, keep painting. Keep drawing. Keep making stuff. Keep the things. Definitely keep. Okay. Take care. Be well. Bye bye.